Hello, and welcome to Virtual Coast Fest 2020. I'm Laura Guagnoli, a ninth grader at Brunswick High School. Here in our studio today, I'm joined by Chris and Justin, and today we're exploring coastal fishing. Thank you, Laura. I'm Chris Kalinowski, a marine biologist with Coastal Resource Division. I've been in my job 18 years. Part of my job is to conduct inshore fish surveys. And I'm Justin Bythewood, a marine technician with the Coastal Resources Division. I've been here for two years. I work with Chris on fish surveys and we'd like to show you a short video about coastal fishing. We'll be back to answer your questions via YouTube and Facebook afterwards. Hello, my name is Chris Kalinowski. I'm a biologist with Department of Natural Resources, Coastal Resource Division. Today we're going to talk a little bit about fishing and the equipment you'll need fishing from a pier or dock. Alright, so this is some of the equipment you'll need for a normal day of fishing. First, we've got our Georgia Fishing Regulations book right here. I uh, recommend you consult this first. It's got all the information you'll need about the size and numbers of fish that you can keep while you're fishing. Some of the other things we have here are a good pair of pliers. Always like to have a good pair of pliers in the tackle box. It can help you when you're tying your line and also removing hooks. We have some of the different types of weights you'll use depending on your application. Standard circle hook here. We like to use circle hooks because they help reduce deep hooking and make it easier to release your fish if you're not going to keep it. Beads, swivels, bobber stoppers. This is an adjustable depth popping cork. We have several different kinds of leader material here, both fluorocarbon and monofilament. Tape measure so you can measure your fish. And I always like to have a good pair of sunglasses. It helps reduce the glare and make it easier to see in the water. Okay, so this is a basic spinning rod setup. This is a pin 3000 reel on a medium weight rod. Um, this is a good setup for inshore fishing. Um, and we usually use these to target trout and redfish uh, in the creeks and rivers. You can obtain a, a setup just like this at your local retailer or your local tackle shop. Um, I would suggest you talk to the, the vendor there and tell them what you'd like to go out and target. They can help you get the right size and the right line class uh, for your target species. Uh, generally most locations can spool these up before you leave and once you, once you leave with these you'll be all set up to uh, head to the dock and go fishing. So we're going to go over a couple of knots you may use while you're out fishing. The first one's going to be the improved clinch knot. For demonstration purposes I'll use this large hook in this line. So you'll start out by passing the line through the eye of the hook, pulling some slack through, and then you twist. I usually twist three to five times depending on the size of the line. Then you'll pass this in back through this first loop there, and then back through here. And pull all that tight. it down, use your pliers, give this in a tug, there, and then you can use your pliers to trim this close to the knot. That's the improved clinch knot. The next knot we're going to use is a uni knot. It's one of the most common knots used in fishing. I like to use this knot for a lot of different purposes. I like to use it to attach terminal tackle at the end of my leader, but you can also use it to attach your monofilament to, um, to a braided line. So this is the uni knot. You'll start out, pass your line through the eye of the hook. Bring the two lines parallel to each other. Give yourself a little extra line here. Then bring this line back down and wrap it around these two lines. I like to do this three to five times. For a smaller diameter line, I'll usually do five times. For larger diameter like 40 to 60 pound liter material, I'll do it three to four times. There, you'll pull that. Give that a tug with your pliers. And then trim that loose down. That's the uni knot. So next we're going to rig up for bottom fishing. Bottom fishing is a technique you'll use fishing from a dock or a pier where you fish vertically. Um, so you'll just let your line drop down into the water. You don't have to do a lot of casting. It's a very simple technique. 
It's used most commonly for targeting fish like whiting or croaker or flounder. So we're going to start out attaching our lead to the main line from the fishing rod. This is braided line that we use on our spinning rod. We're just going to use that uni knot to attach this lead. Four. There's the five twists. Slide that down. I'm going to trim that tag end off. Braided line can be difficult to cut sometimes, but a good set of pliers will have carbide tip cutters. Makes it a little easier to cut that braided line. Next, we're going to attach a short piece of leader material to the swivel on this lid. Again, using the uni knot. Trim off that tag end. Always remember to try not to let your tag ends fall in the water. Put those in recycling. Dispose of them properly. And on the end of this rig, we're going to use a circle hook. That's the hook we talked about earlier. There we go. So again, we've used a uni knot for all these attachments. And that's a simple bottom setup. Bottom rig, circle hook, leader, lead. And you would use this with a small piece of cut bait or a dead shrimp on the bottom. So next we're going to go over a popping cork. This is a popping cork and we'll show you how to rig these up. So this is a popping cork. This is an adjustable depth popping cork which means that you can change how deep your bait is when it drifts underneath this cork. So we're going to start out by using a bobber stop. That's what this small little rubber thing is. And this goes on your main line first. You do that by passing the line through this loop and then pulling this bobber stop up and onto your line, like that. Slide that up a little bit. And you want to use a small bead. Use this one here. And pass the line through here and slide this bead up to that bobber stop, like that. Next, you're going to pass your main line through the center tube and your adjustable depth cord. This can be a little tricky sometimes with that main line because it usually ends up getting stuck. So what, what I like to do is have a little piece of monofilament on standby in the tackle box. Just fold it over. You can pass that through the bottom. It goes right through. out the top of your cork here. Then you can put your main line through that and pull it back through. That's a simple little trick for getting your line through that adjustable cork. And as you can see now, that bead and the bobber stop, stop right at the top of your cork. You can slide these up to adjust your depth. Next, we put a bead at the bottom and tie on our lead. The bead at the bottom goes down and keeps that cork from landing on the top knot that you're going to use on this lead. So again, we're going to use our uni knot here to attach the lead to the main line. Four, five. There we go. Cinch that down. Trim up your tag end here. Then you're going to want to use a little piece of leader material 
underneath that. I like to use 15 to 20 pound liter material. And I usually use about eight to 10 inches of that. So then you'll attach that liter material to the swivel underneath your lid here. Using that same uni knot. And then we're going to use a slightly different kind of hook for this. We'll use a small jig head. There we go. And we're going to come back, trim those loose ends. Both knots. There. Now we're ready to go. So this is your popping cork rig. This is great for fishing along the edge of the grass. One of the good things about the popping cork is there's a lot of action on the surface of the water. When you're reeling on this, you'll you'll want to pop it every few reels, and it makes a clacking noise that uh, that attracts fish. All right, now that we're all rigged up, we're down on the dock. We're going to go over how you rig a live shrimp to fish under your popping cork. So there's a couple different techniques, but one of the most common ones is to rig the shrimp with your jig and put that hook just underneath the forward rostrum, just like that. All right, now that we're ready, we're rigged up. We're going to make a cast with your spinning reel. You're going to hold that line with your forward finger like that. Flip your bail over and make a smooth cast. Once everything settles down, you want to give that cork a pop. All right, so next we're going to switch over and do a little bottom fishing. We're going to use that same rig we tied earlier. We're going to use a dead shrimp. So we'll hook that shrimp through the tail, like that, and drop it in. So we'll drop our line all the way down to the bottom till we feel it hit the bottom and stop, and then reel up just a little bit. All right, got a bite, there he is. Looks like we got a little sheep's head. Let's bring him up here on the dock. So this guy's a little small, so we're going to be releasing him today. So this is where your pliers come in handy. These guys have really hard mouths. So you want to grab him. Be careful because he has sharp spines across the back. There's dorsal fins, really sharp here, here. So you can see that circle hook did its job, hooked him right in the corner of the mouth. Use your pliers and grab that hook close to the mouth. Just back that hook back out. Like that. All right. This guy's ready to release. Sheep's head are a great eating fish, but because of his size, we're going to turn this guy loose. All right. Get him to the water. All right, he's off. Here we go. That's how you practice safe catch and release. All right, thanks everybody for tuning in today. We hope you learned something. We'd like to encourage everybody to get out in the water and go fish. When you do, keep what you need and release the rest. Have a great day and we'll see you on the water. All right, welcome back to the Coast Fest studio. Chris and Justin are ready to take any questions you may have about their program. To ask a question, use the chat feature on YouTube Live or comment on our live Facebook feed. To use the YouTube Live chat, you'll need to sign in as a user and set up your YouTube channel. You can find directions at www.coastalgadnr.org. 
While we wait on questions to come in, I'm going to go ahead and get started with a few of my own. How old do you have to be to get a fishing license? Thanks for that question, Laura. Anyone 16 or older must have a valid fishing license to fish in saltwater in coastal Georgia. Along with that license, you need to have your SIP permit, which is the saltwater information permit, and that's a free permit that you get to go along with your saltwater license. Do you need a fishing license for crabbing or cast nets? Yes, you do. Uh, for any, any of those activities, you also have to have a recreational fishing license and your SIP permit. Looks like we have a question from Robert Todd from McIntosh County Academy commercial fisheries class. What should we do if we catch a fish that has a noticeable irregularity? Regularities happen pretty often. Uh, fish can be born with birth defects, uh, illnesses, get injured while swimming, pred uh, predation. That, it's, it's not uncommon, but if you're unsure, I would bring the fish here and have a fisheries biologist check it out. Sure. And if, if you don't want to bring the fish in, if you want to release the fish, you can take some pictures of that fish and um, email them to one of us. We'll take a look at them. What type of fishing reel is good for beginners? Um, I'd say that you don't necessarily have, any, have to have any kind of specialized equipment. Um, I'd say use what you have. But um, if you were going to buy a reel for saltwater fishing, my recommendation would be to buy a spinning reel. Um, maybe something like one of the reels that we have here in the studio today. Uh, this is just a basic spinning reel. It's a pin reel. Um, I prefer spinning reels in salt water because they're easy to use, but more importantly, they're easy to maintain. Um, most of the components are open, making it easy to rinse and flush after you use it. Um, salt water is corrosive. Uh, it causes a lot of different types of metals to rust, and so you want to make sure you clean your reel really well after you go fishing. Justin, what? What's your I also, preference? I, I prefer a bait casting reel a lot of times for fishing off of piers and anywhere I'm fishing vertical. Um, the same, same things apply as far as cleaning it, but they're pretty simple. You can use them pretty easily, um, inexpensive to buy, and a great way to get started. All right, we've got another question from Caitlin Ball. What is your favorite thing about your job, and what's your favorite fish? <laughs> I'll start this. My favorite fish is this right here, southern flounder. Um, you can catch them all along our coast. Uh, they love artificials, but they really, really love live bait, shrimp, mullet, um, any kind of fish, small uh, bait fish style. Um, and you can catch them using the same, same, size or same style outfit. Um, anywhere you can find vertical structure, pilings, rock piles, anything along that line, uh, just hook your bait, your little minnow, mud minnow on the bottom and uh, just drag it around and you'll feel them come along. Uh, my favorite thing about my job is being on the water. I love being on the water. Yeah. So I'd follow that up and say the same for me. I, I enjoy being on the water. Um, I think we're all, all here doing this job because we enjoy the outdoors and we like to, uh, like to be on the boat and be on the water. So that's one of my favorite things about my job is just being out there, um, interacting with the resource. I'd say my favorite fish is uh, the triple tail. This is the triple tail. It can be caught inshore and nearshore in coastal Georgia. It's, uh, it's a tricky fish to catch. Um, they're typically found around structures like pylons and buoys, uh, crab pots, things of that nature in the estuary. Um, and so I like to go out. I use a spinning rig like I was talking about earlier. Um, a lot, sorry, a lot of times we'll have that rig with a, uh, a popping cork or a float and uh, shrimp, live shrimp on the bottom underneath that cork and we'll go out and fish around those structures for triple tail. Anytime, I would say anytime you're fishing, um, remember your, your, your size limits. Uh, it would be great to swing by a bait store and pick up a fishing, lice, or a fishing reg uh, book, regulation book to know what you can keep and can't keep. Um, and Practice safe releases on the fish that are too small or you do not want to harvest. Good job. All right, so we've got another question from Caitlin Ball. How do you measure the fish? What's the biggest fish you've caught? Want me so, to start? Um, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I usually measure my fish with a tape measure. Um, they make multiple kinds. You can pick up some uh, anywhere, hardware stores. You can pick them up from Coastal Resources Division also. Um, it's a great way to measure your fish accurately. 
Um, the biggest fish I've ever caught was probably a tarpon in the 100 pound class range. Justin, you wanna show them how you would measure that fish to make sure? Perfect. So for a trout, what I would do is start, see if I can get this lined up here. You wanna start it at the tip of his nose and line up the zero and then pinch or swipe his tail toward the end to get the longest total length on your fish. That is the most accurate way to measure your fish. Good job. Yep. And what's the biggest fish you've caught? Uh, tarpon in the 100 pound class range is the biggest fish I've actually caught. Yeah, I'd say the same for me. I think it was close to 100 pound tarpon. All right, here's another question from Leslie Jones, her second grade class. What do you feed fish? Uh, well, we, <laughs> I, I would say we don't necessarily feed them, but we, we try and feed them when we're trying to catch them. Um, and we usually use whatever prey species they prefer. Um, most of the time for me, that's a live shrimp or a prey species called menhaden. Um, I'd say that's what we usually try and feed them. On the coast, you can hardly beat a shrimp. Some kind of bait <laughs> is perfect. Put something on the bottom, something will come along and eat it. Everything eats a shrimp. Everything eats a shrimp. <laughs> All right, we've got another, uh, another question here from Hunt. What rod is good but cheap? Um, you know, that there, there are a lot of different kind of rods, uh, a lot of different brands. Um, again, I would say don't worry so much about brand names or, or specialized rods. Go with what you have. Um, I mean, we see people using all different kinds of gear. I even see people using cane poles in salt water. Um, so I, I'd say a good entry level rod though is uh, a, a medium to medium light rod, seven, seven foot to seven foot six long. Um, and the ones we're using here are pins. Um, you can get one of these in the 50 to $60 range. Uh, but again, there's, there's plenty of other kinds of rods that can be purchased much cheaper than that. I would say you, you focus your gear toward what you're targeting. Put your gear on the species of fish that you're targeting. You don't want to go fish for whiting with a big ocean reel. You want to have it structured to the size of the fish that you're going to be fishing for. Yeah. Good job. All right, we got another question from Robert Todd. It looks like uh, commercial fisheries class. <laughs> what is the best way to release a shark or stingray that we don't want to keep? So that's a good question. I'd say that the, the best thing to do is avoid bringing that into the boat or out of the water if at all possible. So we try and release those over the side of the boat using a pair of pliers. Um, so you wanna stay away from the, the toothy end, keep your hands away from the mouth, use a pair of pliers like these and get, a, get the, the hook and try and remove the hook if you can possibly, but if you can't remove the hook, then you can cut the leader as close to the close to the hook as you can possibly get safely. I, I would also say a rule of thumb that I always use is for fish that I take out of the water. I never take them out of the water longer than I can hold my breath. What is the largest species of fish caught in Georgia's tidal waters? Um, that's a good question. I, there are a lot of different shark species that get over several hundred pounds in coastal Georgia, the bull shark and the tiger shark. But I'd say our biggest sport fish would be the tarpon. Um, tarpon are found in coastal Georgia routinely up to 100 and, and over 100 pounds. I think our state record is 161 pounds, but we've heard of several anglers that have released larger tarpon just because they didn't want to have to land that fish uh, that are suspected to be over 100, 170 pounds. And once again, I would say that goes back to one of the prior questions about targeting using gear that is selected for the size of fish that you're gonna catch. You don't wanna fish for the silver king with a baby spinning rod. You wanna have something geared to handle that fish effectively. All right, so we got another question from Leslie Jones, her second grade class. When you fish, can the fish eat it and then swim away? Unfortunately so, that's, uh, that's called a, a missed fish. Um, and it does happen to, all of the best anglers um, there's gonna be a lot of times where you're out there and uh, they'll steal your bait one of the one of the best fish at doing that is probably the sheep's head they're probably the most difficult fish to catch here in coastal georgia just because they're able to bite and and eat the crab off your hook before you even feel the bite so it does happen yep you'll do a lot of feeding of sheep's head this is for sure there are a lot of tricky fish out there to catch but that's what keeps us coming all right, so we got another picture from Caitlin, or sorry, another question from Caitlin Ball. 
can I fish from the beach? Uh, I'd say yes, that's, that's a great opportunity, a, a great place to access our resource and fish. Um, there's several different kind of species you can catch uh, beach fishing. The most popular is red drum and now's a great time to go out there and do that. Uh, most of the, the red drum that you're going to catch surf fishing are going to be over the slot limit, so those wouldn't be any fish that you would keep. Um, but other fish that are available are whiting. You may, be, may even be able to catch some sea trout from the beach. I love fishing from the beach. I love doing it early spring um, when there's not a lot of swimmers out there. Be mindful of people around you and your surroundings when you're fishing. There's, we're trying to share the beach with swimmers and fishermen all alike, but it, the beach is a great place to go fishing. All right, so we got another question here from Hunt. When is the best time of day to fish? I'll answer that one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to jump you on that one. All right. The best time to go fishing is any time you can go fishing. There is hands down. Uh, 100%. Great answer, Justin. <laughs> How long is a fishing license good for? Um, your average fishing license is valid for up to one year from the date of purchase. Uh, the same with your SIP permit that you have to have for saltwater fishing in Georgia. Also, another thing about fishing licenses, when you buy it in the coast, it does also give you access to WMAs and other accesses like uh, uh, shooting ranges and stuff along that line. I mean, there's great benefits of buying a fishing license. Mm -hmm. What species of fish are the most abundant? Um, that's a good question. I'd, I'd say there are a lot of different prey species like menhaden and mullet that are going to be the most abundant in coastal Georgia. Um, if you're talking for, from a fishing perspective, I'd say the spotted sea trout is our number one most targeted recreational sport fish. It's our most popular fish here in Georgia. Um, they're fun to catch and great to eat. Where do I get a fishing license? You can get a fishing license all over the state. Um, most Hardware, outdoor stores, uh, tackle shops sell them. You can come here to Coastal Resources to get them. There's uh, also any regional office along the state. In the state, you can also get a fishing license that also. You can also jump online. That's probably one of the easiest Easy. ways is jump online, uh, purchase your license online. I think we even have an app now, the Go Outdoors app, yep. and you can use that to purchase your license yep. as well. Where can I dispose of old fishing line? It's a good question. Um, you want to keep that fishing line out of the waterways and so we have a couple of uh, options. We have uh, fishing line recycling bins that are at some of our access points, boat ramps and fishing piers where you can actually take that line and, and put it in that container and then we have folks that go around and collect that and take it to recycling programs. Uh, there's also vendors that have some of those drop off boxes like West Marine and Bass Pro Shops where you can drop that fishing line off. Uh, looks like Caitlin's got another question. As an angler, how can I assist in preserving the fisheries here in Georgia? Uh, I'd start out by saying that purchasing your fishing license is the first best step you can take. Um, and then the other thing that you can do is contribute to our carcass program. And that's a program we have where we have freezers placed out at different locations around the coast. And you can place your fish carcasses in that freezer after you get done cleaning those fish. We come around and collect those carcasses and collect data on those fish. So it's a recycling program for your fish and it's a way that we can collect data on those fish that help us improve our management. Also another way is uh, supporting us by actually buying one of our fish habitat license plates. Uh, more structure in the water will create more fish opportunities. All right, we got another question from Leslie Jones, her second grade class. Can, can you use worms to fish? You can use worms to fish. Um, <laughs> Salt water, not so much, uh, but fresh water, definitely. Um, I'm not going to say you can't use worms in salt water because I'm sure there's something that will eat them, <laughs> but uh, they are usually more targeting of freshwater species. How do I submit a possible record breaking catch? So if you have a fish that you think is a record, uh, we have an application form on our website. You can go online and download that. Uh, we ask you to submit that application with pictures of the fish and the angler included. Um, and we want to remind you to take a lot of pictures of that fish to make it easier for us to identify and confirm that that is actually the species you think it is. You can also bring it to Coastal Resources Division and we can verify it and weigh it here. We have certified scales to do that also and can assist you in paperwork also. Why is angler a term for someone who fishes? 
So that's a question I actually didn't know the answer to until here recently. But um, apparently angler uh, is a, a term used for anyone that fishes with a hook attached to the end of the line, with the hook being the angler. Therefore, anybody that fishes with hook and line is considered an angler. How old do you have to be to get a fishing license? So anybody 16 or older uh, must have a valid fishing license in coastal Georgia. Uh, they also have to have a SIP permit if they're going to be fishing in salt water. Yeah. And that's all the time we have for this session of Virtual Coast Vest. We hope you've enjoyed learning about the Coastal Resources Division's mission. Tune in next time.